You got it. All right. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Happy Earth Day. I am Jan Beglinger. I am the Master Gardener Coordinator here in Genesee County, Batavia, New York for our out of state, maybe out of country friends. And today I wanna to do creating a backyard habitat. I was um, telling some of the folks earlier that this was the first program I created when I became a Master Gardener volunteer back in 2005. So I've dusted it off. I've uh, given it a facelift. I've added some things because stuff has changed since back then. And um, we'll get started. So our natural habitat in this country and across the world, it's disappearing at a rapid rate. Buildings and parking lots have replaced our forests, prairies, and wetlands. And wildlife, it doesn't just randomly appear in a given area. You have to have favorable habitat. So those right conditions, even in your yard, will bring you a host of birds, butterflies, and other species. And if you're wondering if your property size really does matter, even a small property matters. Your uh, landscape is a powerful natural resource. It's home to many creatures. So today I wanna introduce you to um, some things that you can do to make your yard more valuable to our wild neighbors. And this is really an overview some of the slides could be an hour long presentation on their own. And again, feel free to put your questions in the chat box as we go along and we'll answer them at the end. So why do we want a landscape? These were like my top reasons. Of course, we wanna attract birds, butterflies, pollinators, and maybe other wildlife to our yard. It does help us to create and preserve habitat that maybe has been lost and by adding in a variety of plants, we can increase biodiversity amongst flora and fauna. Um, native plants are beautiful. You can add beauty to your yard and studies have shown that a pleasing landscape can increase your property value by up to 20%. So a lot of us just like to observe and photograph nature. So how much easier is it to walk out your back door or your front door and be in nature. We are so disconnected with nature that we think we have to travel miles or take a vacation. So that leads us into the next one, connecting with nature. We all need places to connect with nature. In today's modern society, children especially don't get those chances like maybe we had when we were growing up. Um, we can begin teaching our children stewardship of the land in an early age, and we can introduce them to the wonders of nature in their own backyard. So if you're connecting with it every day, you, you just have that stronger tie to it. And then of course, health benefits, we're finding out through research, it's showing us that gardening and just spending time out in nature can reduce stress, lower depression and anxiety, and just make us all happier. And who doesn't need that? So when you start, um, your process, you want to set your goals for your yard. Start with what kind of wildlife do you want to attract? What percent of your property do you want to use as wildlife habitat? You don't have to use it all. What percent of your property is lawn and how much of the lawn do you use? If you've got kids, maybe you've got swing sets or they, they want a place to play soccer. So take that into account. Um, you probably already have components of a wildlife habitat and you might not all realize it. You wanna do a little plant inventory to see what plant species you have. Are they native? Are they ornamental? Do you have any invasive species on your property? And then of course, how will the neighbors react to a more natural landscape? Um, this is always a teachable moment, but it is something to consider. Um, if you are attracting Rabbits to your yard, your neighbors with gardens next door might not be too happy about that. So assessing your property, this we would do anytime we create any kind of garden, whether it's vegetable, flower, planting trees, you have to know the sun or shade of that particular spot. Your soil pH is extremely important, especially for some of our plants that need more acidic soils. Soil types are important, um, clay, sand, loam. Your hardiness zone, this helps you determine what plants will make it through the winter. 
if you know your hardiness zone. Prevailing winds are always good to know. Ours are out of the west here in, in Batavia. So the west side of my property, I try to put more cold hardy plants because of the winter winds. Topography, you're gonna have wet or dry areas. You know, if you've got a spot that is wet whenever it rains, it might be a good spot for a rain garden. Think about your proximity to the road or driveway, especially if you're in um, an area that gets snow because that salt will come off the roads, even um, spray from the snow plow. And it can be very damaging to some plants, especially um, evergreens. And you wanna take into consideration before you especially plant a tree, you know, what are your overhead wires? What underground utilities do you have? What existing structures are on your property? And last but not least, what can you afford? If you're thinking about putting trees and shrubs in, they can be pretty pricey. So the basic elements of, of a wildlife habitat are food, water, cover, and space. And of course, food, we wanna provide a variety of foods. That's one of the most important aspects of your habitat. And it's actually the best way to attract more species. And I'm talking about natural sources of food, which we'll go into in a bit. Water is essential for wildlife year round, and you can attract um, species that you normally wouldn't see by offering water. Cover, all of our wildlife need protection from weather, from predators. They need a place to raise their family. And it is important to have cover relatively close by to your food and water sources. And then space, this is probably the hardest element to provide because we are limited in to how much property we have. But different species basically have different ranges or territory requirements. So your yard may be part of a territory for an animal and that's okay. So let's talk about food. When we're choosing plants for wildlife food, we wanna think in terms, again, variety, both in the type of food offered and the season it's available. Now, I actually took this picture in January. So it's robins and a crab apple and robins switched to eating berries in the winter. So crab apple, even though it's not native, they can provide food for some of our um, berry eating birds. And then other sources of natural food in cord include acorns, seed, seeds from trees, pine cones, um, berries, grapes, those types of things. And most importantly, we don't think about this, but bugs, caterpillars, that's aphids in there, but caterpillars are extremely important food source for the majority of our nesting birds. So we wanna cut down on the amount of insecticides that we're using because we're killing the food sources of the animals we want to um, bring in, or we're killing our bees and our pollinators and our beneficial insects. So really we wanna limit it, limit it as much as you can, target your pesticides towards specific pests and don't just use broad spectrum things. Because remember those baby birds, they need lots and lots of insects. And flowers are also an important part of offering food, especially for our pollinators and beneficial insects. So of course, you know, milkweed, that's what the monarch butterfly caterpillars need to grow up, but milkweed flowers also offer nectar for bees and butterflies. And, you know, if we look at this picture on the top right hand side, sometimes our flowers get attacked by pests. So are you gonna spray them? Are you gonna cut them back? You can let nature take its course. Are you gonna hope that the birds find them? That's a mm, IPM integrated pest management decision that you, you have to figure out how much damage are you willing to accept in your garden? <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we also wanna pick a variety of flower colors and shapes because um, Bees and butterflies are looking for different qualities. And we also want to have flowers for pollen and nectar from as early as we can in the spring right through late into fall for those migrating um, monarchs and also for our bumblebee queens that are getting ready, ready to overwinter. And trees. Trees are so important in the um, landscape that we don't even think about them. But their foliage, especially of native trees, provides plenty of food for our native 
uh, butterfly and moth caterpillars, those are all in the Lepidoptera order. So plants are the base of our food webs and trees play a huge part in that. Just think of the volume, the biomass that is in one tree compared to a flower garden. So planting trees are a good way to start reducing the amount of lawn in your garden. And you still wanna be careful when you go to the nursery because a lot of the maples and willows and cherries and things that we see at nurseries are actually non-native. So start asking for native species. And water, of course, we're not all lucky enough to have a natural source of water like a stream or a pond on our property, but you can add in a small bird bath or what I do for the winter, it's the bottom picture here, the goldfinches sitting on the ice. Well, that's actually a heated dog bowl. I can plug it in, there's a thermostat that runs it. Um, I scratch up the edge of it with just a little wire brush so they can um, cling to it and I keep it full. I just keep it to the filled up to the top and the birds can come drink out of that. You can also put a rock in it and they'll sit on the rock and then they, they can drink. But bringing water into your landscape allows you to see a variety of other animals. So here's some other options you can do. Um, the fountain, you know, a bird bath or a fountain can become a focal point. Birds are attracted to the sound of bubbling or falling water. Moving water also helps you prevent mosquitoes. So bird baths, you do wanna clean them out every couple of days in the summer. Um, bird baths for, if you're attracting the birds particularly, you want them to have, um, basically you want them to be shallow. An inch to three inches is about as deep as you want. Um, and then this other picture with the clay balls, that's a great one for insects because bees and other insects also need sources of water. So they can land on the clay balls safely and get water that way. And if you're so inclined, you can add a huge garden water feature <laughs> like this family has. And um, it would be great to come out and sit on the porch and watch the frogs and the dragonflies and see who's coming to your yard. So let's go to cover. Um, Again, evergreens are wonderful because they provide cover year round. So if you can leave them unpruned down to the ground, tall grasses, you wanna consider um, maybe planting some native bunch grasses or just leaving in one row by the back somewhere unmown. A lot of our native sparrows, especially song sparrows, actually nest on the ground early in the spring and they'll look for these clump grasses, as will our bumblebees. And then in the winter, you definitely want to make sure you have some cover, um, especially if you're feeding birds, and it just helps them hide from predators. Uh, you don't want to put your feeders too close to them because you don't want cats and the like to be jumping out at your birds. And you can also add supplemental cover. This is like a little woven nesting spot. I used to put them out in the winter for the birds. You can also buy uh, roosting boxes for some of the birds. And then this garden is great for covers. She's got all sorts of um, evergreens, deciduous trees, a variety of plants, and you know things go right down to the ground. There's ground covers, there's stone walls. So just great, you can turn your garden into a wildlife habitat, or maybe it already is. So space, as I said, this is the hardest thing for us to really provide. Um, again, each species has a minimum area that it needs as its territory so that it can get enough food, water, and shelter for raising a family and just basic survival. So it can vary from small habitats to large tracts of unbroken forest. Wildlife need for space refers to more than distance between individuals. It means the total environment within that area. And as we try to squeeze species into ever shrinking space, it can actually mean death for individuals and possibly even species. So I decided that, you know, for those of us with smaller yards that, you know, part of the space is your neighborhood. So this is a bird's eye view of a neighborhood in Batavia and you can actually check out and see what habitat elements your neighbors have. And then you can add to it. Maybe you can find something that's missing. And then 
you know, a territory could be this one neighborhood. And um, this is actually kind of like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. So you want to add the piece that's missing and everybody works together. Edges for diversity, an edge is actually one of the best places to find a variety of animals. You have two different types of plant communities coming together. Now this is a rather abrupt edge because we go from a hedgerow to a tilled field, but you might be like going from a forest to more of a meadow area. So in edges is usually where we find the greatest variety of wildlife. So you can also create edges in your garden just by doing layers. Again, you wanna have trees, shrubs, flowers, ground covers, and that provides all the elements that we need. Now creating these um, edges helps us create wildlife corridors. So each yard becomes um, cover and other elements for wildlife and then they can move from area to area safely. Some other things that you can add, of course, nest boxes. If you're trying to attract certain birds, a lot of them, I think around 50 species of wildlife will use different nesting boxes. Of course, the size of the box and the cavity entrance will help determine what you're going to have. Um, excuse me, brush piles, they provide escape cover, nesting and den sites. They can also serve as supplemental feeding sites or during storms, birds might take shelter in them. Um, snags and logs. Snags are actually really important and most of us when we see a dead tree we just think it's got to come down. But many people just don't realize that it's home to numerous insects and cavity nesting birds and mammals. More than 40 species of birds and 30 species of mammals use snags. So if it's possible and you're not going to be harming property or people, you know, if you do have a tree die out in your backyard and it's not going to fall on somebody's house, you, you could consider leaving it. You could even cut some of it down, cut some of it back. I've seen photos where people have left like the bottom 10 or 12 feet and taken some of the more dangerous limbs off. And then when you do take those limbs off, you can um, put them on the ground, use the smaller limbs to maybe line your paths and as they decay, um, bees and other insects will use them for homes. So dust, mud, and grit, we don't usually think of things like this. This is actually a picture of some butterflies puddling and that's how they get their minerals and nutrients. So just leaving some places for the birds to take a dust bath or mud so that they can build nests and birds actually need grit to aid their digestion. So let's move into native plants. This is a picture of bloodroot. And we're learning more and more how important it is to have native plants in our yards and landscapes. So almost all native species provide some kind of ecological value in their own way. Many have varied and functional roles. Some will host our lepidopteran species, others provide pollen and nectar and others berries for birds. So everybody always talks about the advantages to using native plants. So I came up with um, some of my own and they are very supportive of our native wildlife, especially our insects, more so than non-native plants. And there's been some research, if any of you've listened to Doug Tallamy or read his books, he's done quite a bit of research on this. So our native plants are the basis for our food webs. The 70% native plants in your yard equals happy birds actually comes from uh, Doug Tallamy's um, research again. They were doing some research in I think Washington DC and they kind of came up with this number of 70%. It's the minimum number of native plants. So you don't have to get rid of all your lilacs and daffodils. I'm not going to, but try to increase the number of native plants you have, especially trees. And there is a native plant for just about any site. It's all about the right plant in the right place. We talk about that in gardening all the time. And um, you have to know your site conditions and then pick the appropriate plant. Not every native plant is drought tolerant. Not every native plant can go in a swamp, but they have co-evolved in our um, climate and with our native insects. So by using native plants, again, we can help maintain or enhance that biological diversity 
We can help replace some of the native flora that we've lost because of development. And just realize that um, non-native plants can become invasive over time even, and they will replace our native plants. So something like 50% of the invasive plant species um, were at one point in time introduced for horticulture or gardening, and it might be higher than that now even. Okay, so we gotta make our plant choices count. We um, wanna think of each plant that we add to our yard as food for a bird, bee, butterfly, caterpillar, etc. I took this photo last fall in my yard and I've got, let's see if I remember what they are and I probably don't. Did I write them down? <laughs> All right, so at the top around noon are the locust borers, a pair of those. The moth is a Virginia Tadnuka moth. The large moth on the left is a paper wasp. And then I didn't even realize there was another wasp kind of behind that that's even smaller. So I've got four different insect species on this one plant. So let's, that kind of moves us into keystone plants. And what are they? So a keystone species is um, something in the environment, whether it's a plant or an animal that has a very high impact on that ecosystem and the other, other things that live in that ecosystem. And they're critical to the structure and function of an ecosystem. And they will actually influence what other types of plants and animals make up that ecosystem. So if they're not around, that ecosystem is going to fail. So again, this is from Doug Tallamy's research. Um, National Wildlife Federation put together this native plant finder. You can go into native plant finder, put your zip code, and it will list the top keystone plants or the plants, native plants that you will find in your, your county or your zip code. Um, it's really, initially it was all about the caterpillar species that will be host because the caterpillars are critical for our, our birds. So for woody plants, I put in Batavia zip code in Genesee County, oak, wild cherry, and willow. And the numbers refer to the number of Lepidoptera species that they could potentially um, host here in Genesee County. So I think I put the top 10 in. And then on the other side, I've listed the herbaceous plants. And of course, goldenrod, sunflower, and lupine for Genesee County came up as the top three. Usually aster is in there. I don't know why we're missing aster in Genesee County, but those are usually the top three perennials that you wanna plant in your garden if you have to limit yourself. So caterpillars are this critical food source for over 96% of our songbirds. Um, Doug's research has shown that a pair of Carolina chickadees requires somewhere between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to raise just one brood of young. And that's just to get them out of the nest. That doesn't tell you how many more caterpillars they need to be raised to adulthood. So that's the power and importance of planting natives when it comes to supporting wildlife. So this native plant finder tool does focus on butterflies and birds, but other um, wildlife will benefit if you start, start doing this. So we wanna help restore the health and, our, and function of our local east ecosystems, excuse me. And um, this is a, a good way to start. And I will be sending everybody out um, a reference package that I put together. So the websites and things that I'll be talking about will be listed in that. So you, you don't have to write everything down. So what do I plant, you're asking yourself? Well, these were some um, reliable resources that I found especially maybe for our area. So a lot of organizations do list native plants for their areas. So we've got native plant finder at the top. If you're in the Finger Lakes area, they have a native plant society. Xerces is a great resource for anyone who's interested in helping with pollinators, bees, um, and they will give you lists of plants by your eco region. Of course, Audubon, more on the bird side of it. And there's a couple other ones down there too. And I think I probably even might have some more in the resource list. So again, these are all in the resource list I'm gonna send out to everybody. 
Now the big question is, where do I find native plants? Well, it's a little bit easier to find them now than when I started gardening for wildlife 28 years ago, but it's still not that easy finding the straight species of some plants, um, mainly trees and shrubs. And that's probably what we want to add to our yard. So if you can't find what you want, keep asking at your local nursery. Um, I do prefer to buy local when I can, but sometimes online is an option. I have ordered from Prairie Nursery a couple of times now, but um, be aware that your local soil and water conservation districts usually have some kind of sale like in January, February. The DEC does operate their tree nursery and then be on the lookout for native plant societies, native plant enthusiasts. And again, the American Beauties line, if they're in your local nursery, that is um, all native plants. And I think I even have some more potential um, places to look in our reference material. You can also start your own plants from seed. You can collect seed, you can buy seed. So, um, that's an option. All right, let's go into butterflies in the garden. So butterflies too are suffering declining populations, habitat loss, you're gonna hear this a lot, increased use of insecticides. So when you're planting your butterfly garden, it's all about location, location, location. You wanna choose a sunny spot, preferably out of the wind. Butterflies need to bask to warm up their bodies. You can include some flat rocks that will um, capture the heat of the sun. And when choosing plants, you wanna choose single, not double flowers for easier access to nectar. And you wanna plant groups of the same plant or color together for the, the biggest impact and greatest attraction. Butterflies want to come and go, they kind of want to swoop around a big area. They don't want to do one plant here and then fly 10 feet to another plant. They want it all kind of in one spot. So butterflies like purple, orange, yellow, and red, and they like clusters of flat topped or tubular flowers. And then this is an old picture of um, one of my butterfly gardens. Right now it's got a lot more flocks but I was able to attract uh, monarch butterflies with Agastache. Oh, this is a red admiral on purple coneflower. Black swallowtail on my garden phlox, which is native by the way. And then a red spotted admiral on bee bomb. So those were just a couple of the butterflies that have been in my garden. And then some plants that provide nectar for butterflies. Again, we wanna go from early summer through late summer, um, try to have a variety. If you can't, annuals are good to fill in with and they will come to a lot of non-native annuals for nectar. So there's just a list here and I will make sure that's also in our reference packet. And of course, if we want butterflies, we need caterpillars. <laughs> So this is just a short list of some of the plants that will provide caterpillars. And it's not just herbaceous plants. There's a lot of trees that provide food for caterpillars. So it's important again, not to use insecticides because that will kill your caterpillars. For those who use organic um, Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt in their vegetable garden, that is strictly geared towards killing caterpillars. So you don't want that to be anywhere near your milkweed patch. And um, just having a good mix of perennials and trees. And then of course, be prepared for your plants to be eaten because that's what caterpillars do. They eat plant material. <laughs> okay, so here we have a monarch on swamp milkweed. And that's a uh, the monarch is an example of an insect that has really specialized to one plant group. So if you want monarch butterflies, you have to have something in the milkweed family. Now we have swamp milkweed, butterfly weed. Those are probably the two most easily um, milkweeds that you can find in nurseries. And you also wanna make sure that the nursery you're buying your plants from isn't using systemic insecticides because they can last in the plant for the season and any plant that nibbles on it 
is going to be poisoned. So it's always a good question to ask at your local nursery. I've got a couple examples here of butterfly gardens. This used to be out at the Iroquois National Wildlife Federation. And then this is a friend of mine. I don't think she actually planted it for butterflies, but it's awesome butterfly material. The white in the back is Culver's root. She's got, um, I think that's Queen of the Prairie sticking up there. And then phlox and cone flowers are always good choices for butterflies. And these are all perennials. So let's move on to bees. Like I said, this is gonna be fast paced and it's giving you an overview, but we'll have time for questions at the end. So the total number of bee species in New York, um, according to uh, Cornell is 416, which is a rather specific estimate, but that's what we're, we've been told. Plus there's also 21 non-native bees, which includes our honeybee. And we just don't know a lot about the conservation status of our native bees. They really haven't been studied and we haven't given them too much thought except for in the last couple of years. We do know that a number of our bumblebee species are declining. Again, you know, probably habitat loss, exposure to pesticide, <coughs> excuse me, but there's also been arrival of some um, non-native pathogens that have been affecting some of the bumblebees. So I thought this was a great photo from Heather, well, poster from Heather Holm. It shows the ground nesting native bees and how they nest in the ground. They actually will dig out tunnels in patches of bare earth. So if you have everything mulched, you're probably not gonna have ground nesting bees. But if you find these little piles, that could be what they are. Maybe they're not ants, maybe they're ground nesting bees. So across the US, around 70% of our native bees are actually ground nesters. Now, according to Cornell, in New York State, about 54% of our bees are the digger bees. So again, they need a patch of bare soil to make their nest. And they actually spend the bulk of their life cycle underground as um, the larva. And the adults are usually only active for a couple of weeks. They tend to be solitary. You might find, that, find them in a colony, but each individual bee is doing her own thing. And they tend not to sting unless they're, you know, really you get into their faces. So then the other percentage of our bees are the cavity nesting bees. And this shows you good pictures of what they do and how they nest. Um, so about 30% of our native bees are cavity nesters and they need things like pithy stem, stems or um, dead wood or elderberry or Joe pie weed that they can go in and excavate. Some will live in dead wood and they may even use beetle tunnels or they might ex excavate their own tunnels. <clears throat> when I found this, I thought this was a great visual um, example of what we should be trying to do in our gardens. So basically we're, we're encouraging people not to clean up in the fall. So you leave those cone flowers and bee balm. The, the seeds are good for the birds. You wanna leave the dead flower stalks intact over the winter. And then it's kind of hard to say when in spring, but what you wanna do is leave um, somewhere between eight and 24 inches. I was trying to leave between 12 and 18 inches this year. You can cut back the top messy part of the plant and then you don't really notice the stalks, but you wanna leave the stalks for our cavity nesting bees so that they can use them and lay their eggs in them. Now those won't hatch out till next year. So you just leave them in the garden and then next year they will hatch out. You kind of do the same thing. And this is also one way you can kind of self mulch as they fall over, they add um, compost back to the ground. And it's a great way to just help our native bees. And this was a bumblebee that I found in my garden. He's covered with pollen, as you can see. But I know a lot of us are seeing these um, bee hotels, maybe that's a good way to call them, or nesting logs. <clears throat> so if you notice that the caps, that the ends of the, um, that the holes actually are capped. So that means a bee used that and laid eggs in there and then capped it off. 
So one of the things that we're um, it, researchers are starting to notice is that when we have all of our bees in one area, it's, uh, guess what? It's attracting predators and parasites. So now the recommendation is, is if, you are, are you, if you're going to do this is to kind of spread your bee hotels around, around your yard and not put them all in one place to help lessen um, the parasites and predators that can be attacking your, your young bees. All right, we're gonna move on to, to birds. So I think few of us would deny that there's a lot of pleasure in watching birds. We, we like watching them, their colors are beautiful. We like listening to them. And of course, birds do eat lots and lots of insects and some will even help pollinate our plants. So these are um, plants for fruit eating birds. And again, you wanna have things through the season. A lot of our berries are summer into fall, but we also wanna have those things that hang on through the winter for our birds that don't migrate. Um, some things they don't eat till they've been frozen. So I have quite a sumac stand and it gets cleaned out usually by the end of March. And then of course we have plants for our seed eating birds. So these are things that you don't wanna cut down in the in the fall if you're growing coneflowers and goldenrods and joe pie weed. And then also a number of trees will also provide seed. And you can also supplement with foods, um, depending on what bird you're trying to att attract, you can do a little research. Um, I do feed peanuts, the blue jays and the other um, nut hatches, excuse me, and the woodpeckers like them. Suet, of course, for a lot of our insect eating birds. Uh, black oil sunflower is a favorite food of many birds. Hummingbirds will come for nectar. You just have to make sure that you clean out your, your feeders every couple of days. And then you can even make peanut butter cornmeal um, balls and put them on tree trunks for your, your insect eating birds. And where you place your foods also determines who's going to eat it because everybody kind of eats at a different level. Some are ground level, some will come to hanging feeders, some prefer to be higher up in trees. And one year I had a ton of Orioles. Orioles will come for grape jelly and orange halves and they'll also go for nectar. So I just enjoy watching them. So um, I do put Oriole food out in early May. So other ways we can attract birds to our yards, we did talk about the nesting boxes a little bit. Again, it depends on the um, size of the box and the entrance hole as to who will live in it. I have the wren, house wren on the left here and also habitat. So house wrens and bluebirds have two different habitats. Um, house wrens prefer more shrubby areas where bluebirds want a more open space. So you have to take that in consideration when you're putting up nesting boxes. Of course, planting natural native foods, the birds can eat the seeds or berries themselves. And then yes, again, having some kind of a water source for them. All right, and a lot of times it does come down to habitat. This is a hooded merganser on a pond. They need water, they need fish. If you can't supply those, chances are you're not gonna see a hooded merganser in your backyard, but you can attract other types of birds too. So you might have to do a little uh, research and see who could be coming to your yard. But if you provide fruit bearing trees and shrubs, you can attract cat birds, mocking birds, uh, cedar wax wings, the robins will be happy with you. And you know, leaving a dead tree is attractive to our woodpeckers and nut hatches. Um, so do the research on the type of birds you want to attract, and that will help you determine um, what to put into your backyard. So I didn't want to say this was a messy area because people don't like messy, but birds like tangles and they want places where they can hide and skulk around. Um, I think we have to have a change in mindset about landscape aesthetics because we're way too neat for the birds. <laughs> they want a area where they feel protected. They want to be able to get under our leaf litter and look for insects. But we can also make it 
better for us, I guess. You can, if this is too messy for you, you can just plant an area with shrubs and rake leaves under it. And then you'll end up with insects and earthworms that'll attract the birds. Or, you know, put up a decorative fence around an area. Or if you leave an area unmown, mow, mow paths through it. Uh, put up your wildlife habitat sign to make it more palatable to, to your neighbors. And then this is a photo of the same spot just um, a couple months later. So it's a great spot for young birds to hang out and for other birds and other animals. So everybody loves hummingbirds. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that hummingbirds also eat a lot of insects. So we can feed them nectar. We can supply that to watch them. I, that's enjoyable for everybody. But they also eat gnats, fruit flies, aphids, mosquitoes, tiny bees, and even spiders. So again, we want, we want those insects in our yard. And um, of course, the hummingbird and the flowers that it goes to, they have probably co-evolved because that long beak of the hummingbird and their tongue fits into these trumpet-shaped flowers. So we have jewelweed, we have um, trumpet creeper, and I don't know if they co-evolved with gladiolias or not, but I happened to catch this inquisitive hummingbird female um, checking out a gladiolia. And then um, this was a list that was put together by Operation Ruby Throat. It's a hummingbird site. And these were the top 10 natives that they recommended for attracting hummingbirds. Now, trumpet creeper can be quite aggressive. So you want to have it somewhere where it's not going to like take over your house. And then we have bee bomb. Trumpet honeysuckle is our native honeysuckle. Cardinal flower, jewelweed, which is very important for them during um, migration in the fall. Columbine, Canada lily, Indian pink, that's more of a um, southeastern Pennsylvania native plant. Red buckeye is a tree and um, rhododendron, of course, is a woody plant. But hummingbirds will readily come to a lot of our annuals and some of our other perennials. So again, they like a variety of plants. Doesn't necessarily have to be red for them to go to them, but they do like the tubular, tubular plants. So other visitors to your yard while well, you're making this wonderful habitat. <laughs> so, you know, I had honeybees come to my bird bath. I love, I'm weird. I like black and yellow agriope spiders that you see in the fall. Um, most of us don't like snakes because they scare us, but um, they are good for eating snails and slugs. And then of course we have the hummingbird moth and our friend, the possum. So um, possums, I leave my possums alone because they eat ticks. So, you know, they're fine. I don't, I don't bother the possums. And you can put up bat houses to encourage bats because of course they've had some issues over the years. Um, also a pond or a water feature, you can watch frogs and you can attract dragonflies, which are great predators, both at the adult and the uh, larval stage. So let's talk about lawns. And I, I don't want to insult anybody because I know some people love their lawns, but lawns are basically a giant monoculture and they do contribute to the loss of biodiversity um, in the city and even in the country. So the last study I could find was back in 05, but we have over 40 million acres of lawn in the United States and it accounts for 30% of our residential water use. So it is the largest irrigated crop by area, which is kind of insane. <laughs> and of course, um, to have a perfect lawn, you have to use pesticides, you have to use insecticides, herbicides, and a lot of those things we don't really need. Your lawn doesn't need all of those um, inputs every year. So we do use a lot of pesticides in our homes and gardens which we probably don't need to. I mean, before you spray anything, you should figure out what the problem is. You should be treating that specific insect or weed and not just doing something annually because a commercial tells you to. So if you do wanna start getting rid of your lawn, I came up with some ideas for you. One, of course, is plant a native tree and then underplant it with native plants. 
You can also do a mixed hedge along your property line with a variety of native shrubs. Try converting a section of your yard to a pollinator or butterfly garden. And when you start a garden, I always say start small so you're, you're, you're not overwhelmed by weeds later. If you are, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're mowing a large area, just, I mean like acres, maybe consider don't mow the farthest areas away from your house. Keep it more natural, mow a path through it. You can start a Monarch way station. You can create a bee lawn and I have some uh, help with those in my references, but um, let's get rid of that lawn or at least part of it. So this was one of my master gardeners, Leslie. She started doing that, I think three years ago now. So she sent me some of her photos. This was year one where she started taking out the lawn and planting it with a lot of native plants and some regular garden plants. And this was her second year and it's quite lovely. So I can't wait to see it in her third year. And then this is my backyard. So when I bought my place, um, I'd already owned it quite a few years when I took these pictures, but I had a lot of lawn. Previous owners just mowed. So I started putting in garden beds and planting trees and letting trees come up. And then this was 2014. It's kind of the same view, not exact, but it'll give you the idea. And then 2020, that was last fall. And then don't forget winter. So one thing that I am lacking is a lot of my evergreens have come down through storms or other uh, various reasons. So I'm working on getting more evergreens planted into my, my backyard for cover. So conflicts with neighbors, whether it's four-legged friends or maybe um, someone who doesn't appreciate, you know, like I said, rabbits in your yard. Um, so of course our new style of gardening might be questioned by our neighbors. They might question our sanity, but Again, we have to change that mindset and it does take a while. Of course, homeowners associations or local zoning boards may also have restrictions on what you can do with your front yard. It's good to find that out first before you invest money. Um, be ready to educate with a smile, invite them over for a tour of your yard. Um, you know, Some people just don't appreciate the deviation from the way the neighborhood should look. And some people think our wild, our more native plants are, are too wild looking or messy for a front yard. You might wanna put a sign up in your front yard, you know, get your yard certified and then put up your habitat sign or one of the pollinator signs. Um, of course, planting native plants doesn't mean you can just let your yard go wild or messy. You do want it to still look like a garden. I think that helps. So keeping a neat border will help. Putting a little fence up helps. And, you know, hopefully some of your neighbors will actually look to you for advice. So again, um, some cities or homeowner associations do have rules and you want to check out that first. So you might have to start with your backyard. And again, check with local ordinances, especially if you're out by the street. Sometimes they have height. You can only have plants that are so tall so it doesn't interfere with traffic. And um, again, it's, it's kind of an educational opportunity, but it can be um, frustrating at times. And then of course I didn't, you know, I didn't wanna just say, oh yeah, you're gonna have all these great butterflies and things, but you're making a habitat and other guests will show up uninvited. So things like raccoons, rabbits, you know, maybe they're okay at a distance, but um, there is a potential for animal human conflicts with some of these animals. Um, especially when they become destructive or overpopulated. And it doesn't take long to be overrun by chipmunks. Raccoons can be very destructive in the garden or even to your building. Um, red squirrels are probably fun to watch till they dig a hole in your attic. And if certain animals become too destructive, especially if, you, if you're in a suburban or urban area, you might have to hire a nuisance wildlife control operator they are actually licensed by our Department of Environmental Conservation. And this was, I was at a garden and the people there, they just were being overrun by deer and they were eating everything. So they actually went to the expense of putting up a heavy duty deer fence to protect their, their yard and their garden. 
So let's um, kind of summarize some of the things we've talked about. So these are like, you could pick one or two things, um, you know, just to start out. Of course, one is to reduce the amount of lawn. Um, that lawn can actually, it's, it's kind of a sterile environment for birds and insects. And we wanna reduce or eliminate pesticide use and not just insecticides, but also herbicides and even fungicides. We're finding that the combination of those things when bees um, pick them up and take them back to their hives can actually have a synergistic effect. So they're actually more toxic than on their own. Um, removing invasive species. Do you know which ones you have on your property? I recently hired a crew to get rid of the invasive honeysuckle bushes on my property. Now I didn't realize how many I had till I started tagging them. I have an acre and I tagged over 40 good size honeysuckle shrubs and I pulled out probably a dozen or more and most of them I didn't even realize they were there. So now I have places to plant more native plants, which we wanna do. We wanna add some of those keystone species for trees, it's oak, um, willow and the cherry family. Um, for herbaceous, it's goldenrod, aster, and the sunflower family, the perennial sunflowers. Of course, add a water feature year round, if at all possible. Um, we didn't talk about this too much, but we wanna create sites for caterpillars to pupate and overwinter. So a lot of the caterpillars that live in trees, they don't spend their whole life in the tree when they're, um, when they're ready to pupate, they usually go down to the ground and they try to burrow under the ground. But if you have turf right up to your trees or cement, you know, they can't do that. They can't finish their life cycle. And a lot of caterpillars will also just stay in the leaf litter as will some other beneficial insects. So wherever you can leave leaves, that's great. Um, not everybody can leave them on their property, but getting rid of leaves also gets rid of some of your um, pupating caterpillars. So we wanna take a more relaxed approach to garden cleanup. Again, talk about leaving that 12 to 18 inches of stalks when you cut plants back. Um, what I've done with some of the tops of mine, instead of putting them out for trash pickup, I go, go to the back of the yard and I'm just kind of leaving them in the brush piles or somewhere where if there was something in there, they can still hatch out then. We also didn't turn, talk about this too much, but this is, um, a great thing to do, and it's so simple. A lot of our um, evening moths and nighttime insects are um, being killed by just the use of outside lights. You know, a lot of them have short lives and um, they are just, we don't know why, but they're attracted to light. So if we can turn off our lights or use a motion sen sensor so that your lights aren't coming on all the time or just changing to the newer, uh, yellowish LED lights. For some reason, those aren't as attractive to the moths and other night flying insects. And you can still buy those yellow bulbs. They're not as attractive to most insects either. But if you have a floodlight that you have on, um, just change the bulb with one of the, uh, like I said, they're either cool white or yellow. So go to the yellow zone and just use those. You can also offer a variety of bird feeders and nesting boxes. And last but not least, educate your family, friends, and your neighbors as to what you're doing and why. We have to get people um, to start caring about what's going on in our environment. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about ticks because everything we just talked about also makes great tick habitat. And we have seen a rise in ticks in Genesee County and I know throughout the Northeast, ticks are a problem as is Lyme disease. So Tick Encounter is a great website to go to. Um, it has a lot of information on ticks. Unfortunately, as far as controlling ticks in the landscape, they generally recommend um, spraying with a broad spectrum insecticide, which not only kills ticks, but it kills all those things we just talked about. Um, so you, you have to make some decisions on to how much risk you can um, take in your yard. I have started, I put on my, I call it my tick outfit. I have long socks that I tuck my pants into. Um, I wear my work boots and I spray myself with DEET now. And um, 
even just going out to the garden, ticks can live in a pachysandra bed as well as tall grasses. So be tick smart, learn how to do a tick check. If you have pets, talk to your vet about getting them on um, a tick medication. If you have kids or grandchildren, when they go outside, when they come in, do tick checks. And, um, you know, just, you, you have to figure out what you're comfortable doing for yourself with the ticks. So I just wanted to run through some of um, examples of backyard habitats. So here we have goldenrod and aster in the fall. Uh, having plants that are later in the fall is very important, especially for migrating monarchs and those um, insects going into hibernation for the winter. This is my front yard. The giant plant in the back is giant ironweed. I've got coneflower, phlox, uh, some fleabane and bee balm. One of my coworkers, she doesn't know her pictures in here, but I love her front yard. It's a great way to show how to reduce your lawn and you know the bird bath. This is a garden in urban buffalo. So he's got his habitat sign. He's got a variety of plants, um, not just native plants, but garden plants. And he also has a small um, ornamental pond in his garden. Um, friend of mine in Amherst, she took out a swimming pool and planted lots of trees. It's a small yard again, but she packed a lot of trees into it and it's a great habitat. This is a, actually it's a front yard, but I wanted to show this because this is a, a bed of native plants. Most of them bloom later in the summer, um, but you can see how she's actually given it um, some definition there so that people don't just think she's got a bunch of weeds in the front yard because when nothing's blooming that's kind of what they look like but they will be blooming in August and this will be beautiful and attracting all sorts of butterflies. Another garden where you've got you know it's well defined and you've got a variety of coneflowers and coral bells and the bird bath sunflowers in the back you can see they don't mow quite everything some trees. This was down at Chanticleer. It's a pond that they actually dug. So there's a mixture of uh, exotic and native plants, but a lot of shrubs, a lot of cover around the pond. And again, at Chanticleer, but this is one of our native grasses. It's drop seed grass. And I love it because they kind of used it as a sculptural way in the yard, but it's also great for places for our um, song sparrows and our bumblebees to have some habitat. And if you have a tree die, use it as decoration in the garden or, you know, it's more of a sculpture. And if you live in an apartment, you can have plants, you can attract uh, bees and butterflies in your, um, on your balcony. And this was a uh, out of a Master Gardener article I read in Wisconsin. So they've built all of these boxes and they grow native plants on their balcony. Um, towns and cities can also plant native plants in their um, divides. And then this is Chicago. Um, this is actually a rooftop prairie garden that they put on City Hall, I believe. And I just thought I'd end with this one. This is Singapore and they are actually trying to green up their city. So it kind of looks like the plants are taking over the buildings. And don't forget in winter, your, your animals need cover and shelter and food. And also register your habitat. There are so many organizations right now that are doing this. So National Wildlife has the habitat certification Circe's has pollinator habitat. There's the Monarch Way Station. Um, Doug Tallamy has started Homegrown National Park. So check out some of these organizations and um, you know get certified and buy a sign and put it up in your yard. Here's one, somebody did a bird friendly habitat. And some great books to read if you need some inspiration. Of course, Doug Tallamy's two books, um, Nature's Best Hope was his last one. But the first one that I read, probably back in the 90s, was Noah's Garden by Sarah Stein. 
um, that book also kind of spoke to me and it kind of confirmed that what I was doing, other people were too, and that I wasn't totally crazy. <laughs> All right, so um, I'll just run through a couple slides here and then we'll go to questions. We have a couple of um, programs coming up that if you're on this one, you might also be interested in our health strip plantings on May 20th and also on native plants for butterflies on June 14th. And all of these classes, you can find the registration links on our Genesee CCE Cornell website. The Master Gardener office is open Monday through Friday, 10 to noon. So if you have questions, there's multiple ways to get a hold of them. And again, I'll be putting this um, presentation up on our YouTube page. So when I have it up there, I'll send everybody who registered a link. And it's also on our website, the links. And uh, thank you all today for attending. And I'm going to stop sharing so that I can um, help Bonnie with the chat and see what kind of questions we have. So Bonnie, we don't have a lot of questions in the chat. Let me take a look at them. Basically one from Julie. OK, she missed some of the talk. Do I have a post sign for habitat certification? OK, Julie, so it depends on what you want. Um, like I said, the National Wildlife Federation does. They were probably one of the first ones to do the habitat certification. So if you just want habitat, um, look up National Wildlife Habit, look up National Wildlife Federation and you should find the habitat certification there. Um, questions, anybody, actually, we don't have a lot of questions. So if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, I'm happy to do that. I know people have to get off because it's one o'clock, but, and I know I went fast, but it was just kind of an overview. Um, if you guys want to see future programs like this, you know, do you want one on, Leslie's doing one on butterflies, but um, if there are other topics that you would like to have us do in the future, you can throw that in the chat and then I'll have that. No hand raises. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna. Hello. Yes, Dorothy. Yeah. You, I would like to see a program on how the average homeowner can deal with uh, like bishop's weed and lesser celadine. Oh, our, some of our uh, invasive plants. All right, yeah. we'll see what we can do on that. Bishop's weed, you named probably the two worst things to try to get rid of. I dig, dig, dig. Yeah, yeah, those are both very difficult to get rid of. Yeah. Okay. Well, an idea. It is an idea. It's a good one. Yep. Okay. Thanks. You are welcome.